and welcome back to the Not So Fit Couple podcast with your hosts, Lucy Davis. I'm Benjamin Holden. We are back at the Gymshark Regent Street store today and it is amazing hosting our podcast here. The setting, it's incredible. So a massive thank you to Gymshark. Today we have on immunologist Dr. Jenna Macchiocci, specializes in understanding how nutrition, movement and lifestyle interact with the immune system in health and in disease. With over 20 years of experience, she's on a mission to break down the science behind our health and share the scientifically proven secrets of being well forever. In this episode, expect to learn more about why immune boosting is total BS, how it's more than just about calories in versus calories out, why you need to get control of stress and anxiety before it ultimately controls you, more on why ice baths are changing people's lives and much more. If you're still not subscribed on Spotify or YouTube or Apple or whatever you're listening to your podcasts, then what the hell are you doing? You can also ask questions on Spotify as well, which is a really, really cool feature that Spotify have. So if you have a question and we can also relate back to Jenna, let us know and ask a question on Spotify. It also means a lot to us personally if you can leave reviews or wherever you will listen to the podcast because it's fantastic to see your feedback and it also helps us in making sure that we are giving the content that you want to receive and getting the go- the guests on that you would like to see. Absolutely. Enjoy this episode, guys. What is immune boosting? Because I think it's a term that a lot of people hear and it's thrown around quite a lot. Oh, yeah. This is a good place to start, actually. Yeah. Uh, I think it's used a lot and most of the time it's kind of innocently used. I know what people mean. Mm-hmm. If someone says, I want to boost my immune system, it means they're probably thinking, how can I avoid infection, stay well, you know, feel better, perform at my best. And really, if we look at the science, you cannot scientifically boost your immune system. So it's the wrong phrasing, but it's only really problematic, I think, when brands are using it in an inappropriate way to sell you something, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. then people will believe that, oh, this is going to make me invincible, but it's probably unlikely. So I also think it does a disservice to the immune system because it does so much more than just, mm-hmm. you know, protect you from infection. That's how we tend to think about it, isn't it? You know, mm-hmm. if you mention the immune system, you think, oh, if, when protection. I get cold in winter yeah. and actually it's it's doing so much more. It's It can go wrong if it's too boosted, if I could say that, then it can lead into things like allergies, autoimmune diseases. So these are a huge problem. Um, There are chronic conditions, you know, that people have to live with for for their life. Um, But it's also involved in healing and repair and pregnancy and just keeping you well. Like I like to think of it as the wellness system. So we just think about it as a binary on off that needs boosting or turning off that kind of it you know misses out all these amazing other things that it's doing in our body so really it's about balance there's so many different components of the immune system which bit do you want to boost for how long you know there's mm. a lot of nuance in there that we would kind of remove if we just think about it in simple terms like boosting it because we've said before when you look at mental health and physical health mm-hmm. You always want to be proactively working on them and making sure you're mentally stable and physically well. And so you avoid the injury, you avoid the anxiety and depression. Is it similar with your immune system? You should just always be looking after it and understanding it and helping yourself more. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to look at it. Like nothing's stable, is it? Mm. Everything's always changing, whether that's you, maybe if you know, if you think of a child going through a period of development, they're they're growing, or you think of an adult moving different locations, you're having to adapt. And that's why, you know, fundamentally in our biology, we're really adaptable. Mm. Um, and your immune system is is ad- adaptable by nature. That's one of the fundamental sort of um things, features of of this system. So we do need to be always taking care of it and thinking going into winter, what do we need to do when there are more viruses around because they prefer the cooler climbs of winter? What kind of things can we put in place? Summer, you know, increasing your training load Mm -hmm. if you're training for an event. There's always things that we need to be considering. And uh, there's a real kind of interrelationship between the mental health and physical health component which I think converges at the immune system so um, your immune cells have receptors on the surface for neurotransmitters so if you're feeling good you've got endorphins you know you've got the oxytocin going the love hormone uh, you're in a state of poor mental health all of that is going to be imprinted onto your immune system and it's Mm. sensing that something's wrong and it's going to change its state 
So there's a real kind of two-way street. We call this psychoneuroimmunology. So kind of the way that the brain and the immune system are constantly talking to each other. They're both sensing your environment, taking information in. The brain's, you know, looking around, bringing all your senses together. The immune system's also sensing your environment. Are you, you know, cold or hot or mm. things going on? And it's the two systems are working together and that's kind of the core of your wellness. So we can't really separate the mental and physical anymore. And as you said, you need to be working on both mm. and one will help you do the other. If you've got poor mental health, you're going to struggle to mm. look after your physical health and then vice versa. Yeah. With training then on that note, um, I think a lot of people in the fitness space will talk about how overtraining can sometimes impact the immune system, how it can sometimes have a negative effect. But I think it's for a lot of people, it's very difficult for them to actually overtrain. But what can be some of the benefits of movement and exercise for, for the immune system? Yeah, I think the immune system is really reactive to exercise. Um, I mean, as humans, we're built to move. So it's a fundamental input. And as I said, if we think about the immune system as the sensing system, taking in all this information from your body every day, then movement's a core component of that. And when we move our body, we're moving the lymphatic fluid around our, our body. So we have this system of vessels the lymphatic system is a bit like our circulatory system mm. and we know that the heart pumps the blood around the body so that's allowing it to get around to where it needs to go but the lymphatic system doesn't use the heart to pump it around it uses our muscles our skeletal muscles so if you're sitting all day and you're really slouched you're not going to be moving that lymphatic fluid around uh, effectively and the lymphatic fluid is kind of like the highways for your immune cells to move around the body. They need to move around because they need to perform surveillance of, you know, what's going on. So that's really like just one fundamental component of how we can put, you know, exercise mm -hmm. as a key input to immune health. But then exercise is also doing other things. It's increasing our antioxidant defenses. So that's kind of protecting your body from wear and tear. Um, it's got an overall anti-inflammatory effect on the body and inflammation is part of your immune system's function. So, you know, when you catch a cold, you feel unwell, that's because of inflammation. So we've always got these things every day in our, our daily life that are going to be stressing our body and causing inflammation. So exercise is kind of the counterbalance to that. And then one of the things that I get you okay. You're all right. <laughs> one of the things I get most excited about is the fact that exercise is one of the key ways we can mitigate age-related immune decline. So, you know, for example, with COVID, we would speak about older people being more vulnerable to mm -hmm. COVID. And there was a lot of um, work around trying to protect older people. That's because as we age, our immune system will decline. So we're much more vulnerable to infections. And we know that if we look after our muscle mass and we are working those muscles regularly, we can offset some of that age-related decline. Mm -hmm. So there's wonderful studies looking at really active 70 and 80 year olds who've always been into some kind of sport, um, always been using their muscles, looking after their muscles, and they have an immune age that is the same as like a 30 year old really? or yeah wow. no, it's amazing. I think that's Gramps. I think that's yeah, my grandpa. Grandpa. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. Cause he's 92. Wow. He's had COVID a couple of times, broke his back a couple of months oh, ago God. and he's fine. Amazing. So I think he's probably you're, 30. You're, 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 <laughs> yeah. You're not get up and go on the rower every morning. Don't yeah. My nan stuff. just recovered from breast cancer and she started oh, rowing fab. again. So yeah, that, yeah. as soon as you said that, I was like, wow, they that's, must have the mental age of, yeah, that is the inspiration right there, yeah. isn't it? We need to recruit them into a study. So yeah, we can... absolutely. <laughs> but absolutely. then you can look at the other end of the spectrum. You can look at the 30 year olds who have a real sedentary life mm. and their immune system age is much, much higher. So it's about protecting the muscle mass because we know, you know, every decade after you sort of 30, 40, 50 years old, your muscle mass will will um, mm. diminish mm -hmm. if we don't look after it and give your body the signal that we need it. And then it's also using those muscles because then they are producing these things we call myokines, which are having this real rejuvenating effect on the immune system, keeping it young. So I think it's just, you know, that should be the biggest message when we <laughs> go yeah. out in the fitness industry. And be so like, there, is, there is a correlation with muscle mass then and then uh, immune health. Yes, yeah, exactly. So your muscle is a, what I would call an immune organ. Mm -hmm. It's really um, producing things that are directly affecting what your immune system's doing, just like fat. So muscle and fat are kind of the yin and yang. We need both of them. We need them to be in balance. 
but we know that if we have too much body fat or those fat cells are getting stressed because we're consuming too many calories and we're sort of stuffing it into the fat cells and they don't have any more capacity, they become very inflammatory. So the whole state of the body tips more towards that inflammatory state. And then you, you know, you're getting that's the kind of stress on the body, risking different inflammatory diseases. Mm. Whereas muscle is more kind of rejuvenating for the immune system. So we need to kind of make sure we protect that muscle mass. And I think that's particularly as we age. And for me it's like a woman in my 40s, I speak to loads of mums, you know, I've got kids in school, mm. and I feel like there's that mindset of women that were growing up in this era where you you work out to burn calories and mm-hmm. it's all about weight loss. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, just go pick up some weights, you know. Yeah. Like, it's it's great yeah. to be conscious of calories and, and, and weight and everything, um, but you've got to look after the muscles. We spoke quite a lot about this with Oliver Patrick, didn't we, as well? Yes, and we did. About sarcopenia and mm-hmm. so i'm guessing that's a, a big reason that like immune health ties in with yeah. those who suffer from that because we're speaking a lot about how sarcopenia and obesity are obviously one of the big health risks but also death risks as well yeah does it, so there's an immune health tie in quite closely with both both those obesity and yes sarcopenia. definitely just because this kind of proportion of body fat and the diminishing muscle so you're sort of shifting that ratio and by doing that, you're giving this whole kind of inflammatory um, uh, condition to the body. And, you know, inflammation is really important because, like I say, if you get a cold and you feel really lousy, the inflammation is there fighting the infection, but it's doing it in an acute phase. So mm-hmm. it's doing it over three to five days. But if you're kind of generally inflamed all the time, it's like um, damaging all the different structures in your body. You know, that inflammation is designed to to make viruses and bacteria uncomfortable Mm -hmm. when they infect you. It's not meant to be there all the time. And it can start to damage things like the blood vessel walls become more sticky. So then you're getting that cardiovascular disease risk. Um, It can, you know, just damage the DNA and then you're getting risk of certain cancers and things. So it's all feeding into that kind of, you know, the chronic diseases that we hear about that are growing uh, in number and and becoming more of a health risk um, than ever before. I remember during COVID because we did a podcast on actually the correlation between COVID and obesity because nobody was really talking about it. And it took like the government a really long time to come out with the move more initiative and get people moving and exercising. And it was almost like forbidden, like people were really scared to talk about the relationship between COVID and obesity, but it was there because the stats yes. were there and yeah. the amount of deaths and things like that. So yeah, yeah no, with um, COVID in general, for you personally, did you, I don't know, in some level find it a little bit frustrating with your line of work, with what you do? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess on the one hand, I was in a position where I could follow what was coming out and what information was available with a kind of scientific lens and Mm. and a bit of critical thinking. So I wasn't kind of going into panic mode, but I did find it unfortunate now when we look back. I mean, particularly the the data you mentioned, when you look at the data in children, there's like a huge jump in obesity Mm. in kids during those two years Mm. where we had on and off lockdowns. And I think once that happens in childhood, that's a really difficult trajectory to change, isn't it? Because yeah. you kind of, it's tied in with habits as well yeah. and, and the whole picture. I think we definitely went too far with disinfecting everything. So we maybe needed a reminder that, you know, coughs and sneezes cause diseases. You know, that was something probably our grandparents yeah. were very aware yeah. of because at one point we didn't know that. And so that was how germs were spreading. So it was good to have a refresher, wash your hands, etc. But we don't need to sanitize everything. We don't need to wipe down our shopping with, uh, yeah. you know, disinfectant. But in the early days, we didn't know exactly what we were dealing with. So I think the pendulum swung too far. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, definitely not enough was done to sort of mitigate the effects of the lockdowns. That seems to just kind of been forgotten. And mm-hmm. I think we will be seeing the effects for quite some time. Yeah. yeah, That's one of the times I think everyone's probably used to, like people's mum, mum telling them, well, back yeah. in my day, we didn't have all the cleaners <laughs> and the soaps and stuff. Yeah. How, how important are they or non-important are they for the amount of cleaners and bug protectors and whatever else they've got to kill viruses and stuff? How important are, are those in like the everyday home, do you think? That's a really great question. So I, I get often asked by parents, you know, what can I do for my kid's immune system? And it is a great window of opportunity to manipulate an immune system down a healthy path because 
kids are developing and growing. Um, and there's some lovely studies looking at um, daycares where they put children into um, daycares that have been enriched with dirt and plants and grass. And the kids spend a lot more time digging around in that, a lot more time outside in natural environments. And they have... Um, actual empirical changes in their immune system so benefits can be seen that measured in the blood just from spending time in nature so when I say to people when we think about germs we can't lump all germs together mm -hmm. because there's germs everywhere there's germs in the air we're breathing there's germs in you know there's a microbiome of this um, city that we're in right now and it's the good germs that we need to be exposed to the ones in nature that you know let the kids dig in dirt go for a walk in the park go get into the countryside you're breathing in good germs that are going into your body in your airways and your gut they're nurturing your immune system they're training and educating it and that's really important wash your hands before you eat that's yeah. great you know maybe you want to clean after you've been chopping raw meat in your kitchen but you don't need to like go to the level to try and eliminate every germ because that's where we've gone wrong yeah. so we now know that these germ exposures to these Good germs is really important for our immune system and that's what's kind of been eroded and we're seeing this rise in allergies and autoimmune diseases because the immune system's kind of got confused it hasn't got the right inputs over the the particularly during the early years but as adults as well that's so interesting to hear as well because i think people's psychology is often very different and people yeah. are mitigating the exposure to those yes. germs and stuff and then the body that i'm guessing the immune system doesn't have the chance to adapt a little bit like, like weightlifting. We put ourselves through stimulus yes. so that we can get stronger and the body adapts to that stimulus. Exactly. And yeah, that's a great way of thinking about it. And that's kind of how we word it when we're looking at the science. It is kind of the training and educating of the immune system through getting exposed to good germs. But we've been so busy trying to limit the infectious germs that we've mm -hmm. eliminated all the germs. And then, you know, we're not getting those right <laughs> exposures. So yeah, we do need to wash our hands after going to the bathroom. We do need to have sort of a level of high hygiene but we don't need to be too clean because mm. now we know that's that's damaging yeah isn't that so interesting almost you're too clean you bubble wrap your kids and they can't yes. do anything yeah well that's going to make them more ill yeah and that's a really because that definitely happened in covid because everyone was so clean it was the cleaning the sing happy birthday yeah. wash your hands 10 times over and yeah i remember i we washed our hands so much at the start i started getting blisters because i was so paranoid oh, no. and because that's what that's what the news did, was yeah. saying though yes, i was just yeah. really in the early I'm, stages you yeah. can only go with the information you've got yeah exactly mm. we didn't really know what to do and i'm quite a clean person anyway aren't i, I like i quite like just like cleanliness but then i i was Just getting bit, yeah. i was getting like obsessive with washing my hands which yeah. was like damaging for me yeah and didn't help at all but it is really interesting that like, you shouldn't bubble wrap your kids because then you send yes. them to preschool and they're gonna yeah. be really ill i think exactly. a lot of mums get, probably get worried that their kids are like magnets to germs and stuff and they bring them in as well i don't they? I know my sister definitely does mm. as well yeah, I think it's tricky because uh, a lot of kids nowadays will go to daycare, uh, they'll be in school and, you know, it's a work in progress trying to remind your child to wash their hands, <laughs> to sneeze into their elbow and not like on the whole class. And so it, the reason that kids do get sick more often is because they're not very good sometimes at those sort of basic public hygiene things, but also because their immune system is developing, it hasn't been exposed to um, germs and in the same way that we have so it's got sort of no backup no memory of those exposures um, and so it's kind of if you're putting them in a situation where they're surrounded by lots of kids sadly there will be lots of germs yeah. coming mm -hmm. home um, but you know teaching them about the good hygiene stuff and then looking after the other aspects so building up their immune system nutrition and the, you know getting out in nature mm -hmm. and all those other things to sort of offset that are really important one of the things I think we naturally do as humans, and we do it in all areas of life, we want the best five things to boost our immune system, the best five <laughs> things to lose fat, to do this, to do that. And a lot of people would say it's easy just to take a, a pill, take a mm -hmm. supplement, take this, take that, rather than doing the whole process of forming the habits and, you know, yeah. going along the process. What, I guess, like, what are your best pieces of advice in terms of, like, because that's not true. You can't just boost your immune yes, system in yeah. five ways. And I assume you get that question yeah. a lot of the time. So how do you more so deal with that? Yeah, I mean, probably response? I was guilty of entering this 
um, field with the same thoughts, you know, 20 years ago was probably thinking like, oh, what are the five things that mm. I can do every week mm -hmm. or take every day that are going to make me invincible? Um, and so I had to kind of go through that learning process um, myself. And I think the science really stands out when it comes to diet, that the diet pattern is really important than thinking of like, you know, five superfoods. Mm. And to me, thinking about that, it that way is really helpful because you're not the sum of what one meal is. You're the sum of what you've eaten habitually over weeks and months. Um, and there's been a real switch in the nutrition field towards diet patterns. So that's just, you know, the foods you eat regularly. Mm. Um, and so it's making sure you cover those micronutrients. So we often think about vitamin C and zinc as being important for your immune system. But really, if you're deficient in any of those micronutrients, you're going to have a, a impairment. So, you know, are you low on iron? For example, a lot of people are low on magnesium. So that's where you might want to supplement an already healthy diet pattern. But overall, we want the pattern to be to be there. So it doesn't matter if you went out last night and ate all the junk food and whatever. What matters is what what was the consistency mm -hmm. across the week? Um, and are you getting in all those key micronutrients, all the right macronutrients? And one of the reasons that we can't substitute our diet with the pill when it comes to the immune system is because the immune health is so dependent on the health of your microbiome and the microbiome loves plant fiber so it's wanting that diversity of different plants in your diet fruits vegetables nuts seeds fiber from you know legumes beans pulses herbs spices the more diverse the different um, fibers are, you know, it's it's like fertilizer for a garden. So mm -hmm. you want to have a really dynamic ecosystem of different gut bugs in there that are going to be very resilient to things like, you know, getting a, a food poisoning infection, but also that are going to be educating your immune system because you have about 70 to 80 percent of your immune cells located along the digestive tract and what's happening in the gut kind of then transmits to the rest of the body so you know you can alter dietary fiber improve the gut environment the health of the microbiome improve the immune system and see better resistance to respiratory viruses for example so it's mm -hmm. affecting the immune system in the airways it's like a little walkie-talkie between the gut and the lungs or the gut mm -hmm. and the urinary tract so um fiber is not really something we can easily put in a pill you might see fiber added to certain foods but often mm. it'll be like one type of fiber not the sort of plethora of different types you see when you you know have a lovely colorful meal with lots of different um plants in there so i think that's something that was overlooked before and a lot of the literature on the immune system and diet was quite old-fashioned going oh we need vitamin c for this or we need zinc for that but actually we need fiber first and foremost to have a healthy immune system and then we need to make sure all the other bits are in place wow for, for most <laughs> people they're not getting those things all they're not getting a mixed colored palette of food or they're not getting a, a five a day in and, yeah. and one, of, one of the things that we've taken quite religious for a while is i'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are on it and that i think they're becoming ever more popular, popular and sexy is, is green drinks um, yeah. we usually use either like my protein greens or one of the really popular ones that we've used as well is athletic greens yeah what is your opinion on, on those sorts of drinks as well do you know what i um i'm, I'm not a smoothie lover because of the texture mm. so i tend yeah. to like avoid smoothies but i think that's just me being a bit weird i don't, I don't um, think it is i think especially with green drinks they usually taste like sand yeah and they don't have the best flavoring yeah but I do make my own greens drink um, oh, wow. just because you get to some points in your week and you've got loads of like veg that you might need to use up all in one go. And I got into this routine of doing it and then I kind of made it into my pre-workout because I'd put loads of like nitrate rich veg in there. So you're getting that nitric oxide mm -hmm. boost. And um, yeah, so I think that they have their place, but I don't think they should be replacing chewing foods because mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. there's something quite important about the way we chew and the speeds that we eat and there's even new data coming out now about links between how we digest our food and how that's going into our bloodstream and our bodies dealing with that with you know blood fat and blood sugar levels um, based on how quickly we eat it so obviously if you're drinking your nutrients it's having a little bit of an effect but actually I think there's probably very few studies really d drilling into these type of green mm. drinks and how they translate i think if it's helping you get you know more nutrients in your diet and it's complementing an, a nice healthy balanced diet then i think it's there's probably no problem in it do you think 
some people will take so many supplements to help their immune system, it almost does the opposite effect and becomes more so damaging. Like they take the greens, they take this, they take 10 different immune boosting supplements. Oh, um, and it does actually the opposite effect. And I don't know, would it make them ill or how yeah, would that work? I think um, you can be really off the mark with some things. I know when I've done my own blood work, I've just been quite surprised mm. and think, oh God, I did not know that was something that I was deficient in, for example. Um, and I think you have to maybe question why, like on a psychological level, why you have that need to, you know, buy these things. We're investing in our health, we're spending money. It must work, it must help. Mm. And sometimes you have to wind it back and say, maybe we can just take a moment and look at what we're eating, look at our relationship with food mm. before we start to throw in all these supplements. Because there isn't anything that will make you invincible. And like you say, some is good. Too much might not be so good. So too much vitamin D can be very toxic. And um, there's studies with things like beta carotene, too much of that is not very good for you. Vitamin E can actually uh, reduce the function of your immune system. So I think that we shouldn't be going blindly into this. Um, I think if you're getting a multivitamin, say one that's designed for women, it's probably um, been put together in a way that you're unlikely to sort of go overboard. But mm -hmm. sometimes people will be taking different supplements that will have like doubling up on the same nutrient, yeah. plus they're getting it from their diet, and then it could be getting into um, difficult territory. And often you, you you don't know for some time. Mm -hmm. You take it for a period, and the some symptoms can be quite subtle. And um, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for blood work. Not everyone has access to that, but it yeah. can be really enlightening to just have a really comprehensive panel as a starting point, mm -hmm. and then you're not stabbing in the dark anymore. We yeah. spoke about that quite you a few love times. That, don't yeah, you? I get my bloods done two or three times a year usually. Yeah. Just because I, th I think, especially because we're in the health and fitness industry, yeah. it's it's really easy to see yourself in the mirror or to take different metrics like how much you weigh or yeah. how you're performing or how your runs have been or how your lifts have been. But it's not really getting like an MOT where you can see what's going on underneath the hood and seeing yeah. what, what the real issues are. And, and without knowing that, you're kind of blind to things yeah. that could cause potential issues down the road. So I think it's something that's definitely been helpful for me. But I think for a lot of people, either one, it isn't in the back of their mind or yeah. two, it's the accessibility or the pricing of it yeah. that sometimes is, is going to be a... I suppose a, a stumbling block to them getting yeah. it done. And I always say to people, like, you you need different nutrients for different things. So, you know, going into winter, definitely get your vitamin D um, and, and be taking that daily. But then now we're in May, the sun is high enough. If you're getting outside regularly, you probably don't need the supplement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be fine. If you're in a really stressed period... There might be more demands for certain nutrients, things like B vitamins, or you might want to lean into some of the more nootropics to, to, to manage that. If you're pregnant or trying to get pregnant, you know, those different sort of life phases, or if you're training for an event, the demands might be higher. So you kind of have to almost sit down and get your, if you, if you want to invest in different supplements, think about what do you need in your medicine cabinet for different mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I've got my little stash of things for when me or my family, you know, get a cold or flu then there's evidence that taking more vitamin C and zinc can reduce the length of that. Mm. So that I won't take that every day because I don't need it. But when I am sick, I know my nutrient requirements are higher. Yeah. So keep it on hand. So things like that, I think, are really worth um, thinking about. Mm -hmm. Some people just take them too far, don't they? I remember I had a friend who like literally would rattle as he walks and he'd piss green and bleed blue just oh, because he's, yeah. he's taking That's so many he goes different, too far and different just things. Just yeah. Doesn't, yeah. It doesn't help. But I think one of the things in... The fitness space, which is a big focal point, is calories in versus calories out because mm -hmm. that's like the basics of base of weight loss, mm -hmm. um, and and obviously that's the bread and butter of, of losing weight. But how much are we missing out on those nutrients and vitamins and minerals? And uh, when it comes to food quality, what how can we better optimize our immune system with foods? Because I think, especially for people who will be listening to this podcast and people in the fitness space, they will have heard us talk about it quite a lot because when it comes to weight yeah. loss, yeah, a lot of people stick to things like if it fits your macros and calories invested, calories yeah. out, but then less importantly would would focus on the nutrients and the, yeah. the food quality. How, how important that is immune health and gut health? I think that's re a really key point. I think there's a few things in the fitness industry, isn't there? Like, mm -hmm. you know, the way you look physically might be amazing, but doesn't necessarily mean that you're yep. optimally mm -hmm. healthy. And then there's trying to eat to achieve a certain physique or a certain um, uh, sort of goal, fitness goal, that might not match with what is best for your sort of 
overall immune health and your your long-term health um and so i think that is a message that we need to really get out there that you know um first of all if you just look at like the the macros you know carbohydrates are so important as an energy source and your immune system is quite an energy intensive system so when you get sick and you get a fever you know your basal metabolic rate will rise by about 15 percent because that is fueling the the, the switch the, the the immune cells will switch their metabolic state and start sucking up loads more sugar from your body as an energy source as they go to work them um, getting rid of the the virus or whatever's making you sick so you need to when you're in a calorie deficit and you're reducing things like the car, uh, the availability of carbohydrates, there is a risk of um, depressing your immune system, mm -hmm. making you more likely to get sick. And we do have studies in athletes where we see this. And then obviously, if you get sick and you're, you know, you're reducing your calories because you're trying to train for a particular event or reach a particular physique, you might end up missing out because it's affected your training. Mm -hmm. And so being really careful about replenishing carbohydrates you know if you're training for more than 90 minutes or training several times a day then we do need to make sure that we replenish because when the glycogen stores are really low that's uh, triggering a sort of stress on the body that is going to lead to that immune depression um, and then you know if you are reducing calories you're reducing the amount you eat therefore you could be risking being deficient in certain nutrients just by virtue of eating less so again those mm -hmm the food quality is going to be really important. So you might want to eat, I don't know, cookies and ice cream for your, um, you know, your macros that day, but you're not going to get all the key micronutrients. So over time you get deficiencies, then you're going to be left um, more vulnerable to infection. And I think we, you know, we get colds and flus regularly. It's normal. An adult will get, you know, four to six a year just because you're around people, you share germs all the time. But I think what people don't realize is it can affect your training for three or four weeks. You know, you have an acute illness, you've got fever, you're stuck at home, all the horrible symptoms, you feel better. If you go back to training too quickly, then you probably set yourself back, you risk having a longer mm. recovery time. So I think there's like, we really do need to think about the sort of recovery from infection as well. And that, that acute period of being ill for three to five um, days will have really depleted our nutrient stores and so we have even more need to make sure we build that back up in the weeks um, mm. following that as we're building up you know training load again and that's one of the big questions that we yeah. always get is like when, once I've been ill how quickly can I get because everyone just wants to get back in the gym yeah. performing moving again especially our, our sort of audience mm -hmm. um so what kind of I know illnesses and colds and stuff are going to be really specific mm -hmm. to, to the individual but what sort of advice would you give to someone who's maybe taken a couple of days off the gym or like doesn't know when they should be going back because I mean when people are ill they've got a stress on the body and then they go yeah. in and put more stress on the body because they're, yeah, they're training exactly. and stuff what what would the advice be to someone who's looking to go back when would be a, a good point of call or what would be a good reference point i think depending on the starting point of that person's health status how severely they were ill you know was it just a mild cold were they in bed with flu mm -hmm. kind of taking that into account you consider those two to four weeks after you're symptom free as when you're sort of building up and in particularly in the first two weeks you're not going beyond like 80 percent of your max yeah. um and that you are really focusing on rebuilding those nutrient stores and sort of looking after yourself and just moving the body because the going back to what i said earlier about the lymphatic flow you're having to clear out all that inflammation that your body had, all the kind of metabolic waste from fighting an mm -hmm. infection. So you wanna make sure your body's getting rid of that. So the lymphatic fluid needs to be moving, delivering all that to the liver and getting um, it out of the body. So maybe you can't go and do like 90 minutes, you know, cardio session, but you can go for a walk. Mm -hmm. And that's probably, hopefully scratching that itch to move, but it's not gonna tip you over. And, you know, you, your exercise tolerance is even less, you know, during the illness and in the weeks following it. You can be more at risk of things like heat and exhaustion, um, you know, just uh, dehydration. There's a lot of stuff still going on in your body that you, you might feel better, but you're still sort of coming back to normal. Mm -hmm. Just regarding the diet from what you spoke about before, you you briefly touched on it. I just wanted just to pull one question out. I don't know if this is a fad, but a lot of people, probably more so like three or four years ago, for like weight loss, for example, would cut out dairy 
for weight loss or would cut out gluten for weight loss when they don't actually have an intolerance. Mm. If you cut out a food group or like a, like a dairy or gluten, will you give yourself an intolerance to it because you've cut out your diet for so long? It's possible because things like dairy, a lot of us will lose our genetic ability mm -hmm. to digest dairy as we get older. So really? some people retain it. So we obviously have it as a child. Um, so we can sort of switch the gene on and off. So we have it as a child. And then as we get older, a lot of people will lose that, um, the expression of that gene. Um, because, uh, you know, as an adult, you may not need to drink milk, but um, many people retain it. Otherwise, we rely on our microbiome to break down the milk for us or whatever it is, the gluten. Um, and if you don't eat that food, you risk losing the microbes that are helping you digest it. And who knows if you can then get it back again. So I think mm. for some people it might be okay, but for others they might find that they've given themselves an intolerance. Yeah, yeah it's really interesting. Because yeah. I know there was like, it was, it was kind of a fad. A lot of people just yeah. started cutting out food groups yeah. for weight loss and particular things when they didn't necessarily need to do that at all. They just yeah. needed to reduce... Yeah. overall calorie intake like goes rather the eras, than isn't it because some people like yeah, we went for the era where people cut sugar cut dairy <coughs> go through different trends yeah I, i've definitely noticed when i've been dieting or when we've got lean i'm uh i get i pick up, pick up illnesses a lot lot easier yeah. um but in respect to different diet types like I was listening to two women on the train yesterday on the way back from the Manchester run actually and she was like I need to lose a few pounds so I'm going to try doing the, the ketogenic diet next week is the diet in particular which miss out on key micronutrients and macronutrients such as those that are detrimental or don't potentially help the immune system yeah that's a tricky one because I don't know if we have like really comprehensive data there's a lot of stuff around intermittent fasting and the immune system because there are small limited studies showing that if you go without eating for a certain period of time you get this kind of rise in, in stress chemistry uh, and it um, will lead to any kind of old and tired immune cells um, just deciding that you know that's the end of their life because it's too stressful and this will allow a lot of new fresh immune cells to be produced from the bone marrow so you kind of have a kind of um, clearing out of the old bringing in the new um, which has been shown to be beneficial in certain um, disease states so there's a lot of kind of talk around intermittent fasting but we don't yet have a protocol in humans that we can say oh this is how long you should fast for in order to switch on all these metabolic processes mm -hmm. and get the immune benefits um i think any diet where you're affecting your microbiome that would have a knock-on effect mm -hmm. on the immune system so i'm quite sure if you're eating a carnivore diet you're gonna damage your gut microbiome oh, yeah. I, I, did that for, I did that for a month <laughs> Did you? Like, yeah, you it was just doing it like a test, a like a YouTube video. Oh, interesting. Um, and my stomach was really strange off it, especially the first two weeks. Yeah. Um, it was difficult. Appetite was really strange. Yeah. For, for a little while. It was what you were eating. You were just eating meat. I think I was getting up course. and just having like bacon in the morning. <laughs> and then it was, just, I think it was really difficult to keep up even on the go as well, you know, because like yeah. I, if, I was, if I was moving around, I'd just be eating like a pack of salami. Which, and because it's really high fat high protein yeah it, it it can be quite quite satiating because the amount of calories you're getting per meal but then you're still left hungry because the volume of, of, of food isn't that big yeah yeah so strange. it was a it was just it was a strange strange time doing that <laughs> what was your to. first meal yeah. after carnival <laughs> I don't know. I, might have just, I, I probably just went out yeah. the Mackey's or something, didn't, didn't yeah. I? something some good old hearty food but <laughs> i don't think things like that are sustainable yeah anyway no. but i i intermittent fast that was interesting what you're saying before what the yeah. The fast things I usually do, is it the eight, like 16, eight, is it? Or am I getting that wrong? You, you 15, eat eight. like 11 ish. Yeah, no, sorry, I finish eat. No, I, I eat about 12 and finish eating about eight or nine pm. Yeah, yeah, so like eight hours. Yeah. I think if that, if you can find a pattern that works, a lot of people mm. just anecdotally report feeling better i do think there's there's data showing that we've become real snackers and so we eat from you know the minute we open our eyes until mm. the minute we go to bed so like 16 hours a day your body's in what we call the fed state so that means that you're digesting food that sort of post eating state which is actually mildly inflammatory because when we eat um we get a bit of a leakiness in our digestive tract as part of the 
digestive process and you've got lots of bacteria in there and all the bits whatever you've swallowed and so you get a transient rise in inflammation in the blood so if you're eating all the time you're kind of always in that state and I don't think we have enough long-term data to really say that this is not mm. good for us but it kind of we get the sense that eating all the time isn't uh, isn't the best thing mm -hmm. because of this kind of inflammatory balance and the toll that that takes on the body over you know several months years so I do think there's something to be said for kind of consolidating food into meals mm -hmm. and having consistent meal times the digestive system definitely likes that consistency so you know you get hungry at the same time every day don't you if you mm -hmm. eat every day then you might go on holiday and you're like um, my yeah. tummy's rumbling but we're in a different time zone <laughs> yeah. it's because you start producing the digestive juices your body's saying oh I normally get fed at you know 12 o'clock so I'm going to prepare and so that's making the digestion um, the digestive process better so anyone who suffers with any sort of digestive issues which I think is nowadays quite a lot of people then it's good to really look at that consistency and also we have this thing called the migrating motor complex which is kind of how your gut and brain and everything are coming together to migrate the food through your digestive tract and that can get a bit confused if you know food's coming in at random times or if we're eating um you know in between meals and that kind of thing. So I think that's a really good strategy for anyone who suffers a bit with their digestion, mm -hmm. just, you know, and, and chewing the food, you know, we, it's one thing we all do. <laughs> I know I'm guilty of this as well. My kids, they tell me, mommy, slow down. Stop <laughs> eating so fast. Because yeah, that, again, that. is just telling your, you, you know, your brain is talking to your gut saying, okay, food is coming. You've got lots of digestive juices in your mouth. So that's starting the process of breaking down the food so that you have, you know, it's taking some of the lifting away from the rest of the digestive tract. And then just that that rhythm of eating at the same time every day. It's really interesting the stuff on terms like chewing foods. I think I've had like quite a few different stats about how many chews you should be taking. Which I mean, t for some people is going to be completely undoable because no one's sitting there counting the amount of chew <laughs> chews that yeah, you're doing. But it, <laughs> it is interesting, especially because now, like with the the ease of like hyper palatable foods that we yeah. have in house satiate and the are people are just you see some people people are scoffing them in yeah um, sometimes yeah. so it's really interesting i suppose like some of the readings that are coming out yeah. to do with like the the amount of chews exactly. or the amount of times that you're so if you have like one. a you know a big salad and there's lots of like raw vegetables in there you just can't scoff it down because you'd really mm. you're you get that instant feedback yeah. that your tummy is not happy because you haven't chewed half of the you know chunks of cucumber or whatever but then if you had like you know a, a massive thing of crisps or sweets or anything you barely need to chew it it can it go straight down. straight down and so you can easily consume more before you have that time for your brain to say okay I'm full now you know there, there's a bit of a time delay there and so I think we do now know that those highly palatable foods we can easily over consume them and so while they're not intrinsically wrong we have to think about if we're over consuming them we're probably then mm. under consuming the, the more healthful foods so mm. I think people just need to think about about the volume of things that they're consuming and what they might be replacing and uh, you know doesn't mean you can never have them but thinking about that relationship to them mm. in a bit more detail I find it really really interesting what you were saying before about your mind brain and your gut yeah because I've had some really bad experiences with my anxiety and mm. the brain gut really bad stomach I ended up was it about four years ago now five years ago yeah a very long time ago I had really bad stomach issues after I stopped swimming and they they just never went away yeah always there I had a really healthy diet I was like I don't know what it is yeah ended up having a laparoscopy where they oh. went in to check for endometriosis yeah. or pelvic inflammatory disease and all they said to me was oh your bowel is just a bit inflamed but it's not IBS so I kind of left right. this thing thinking, great. So they said, go on the FODMAP diet. Okay. And I remember just not really eating anything. It was all really, I was following this chart and I was being really yeah. adamant thinking, oh, okay, this must work. This must take the pain away. Yeah. And I was getting quite stressed and anxious about following the FODMAP diet because yeah. nothing was working. And then Ben one day, he was like, but you're like a really anxious person. You have, an you have anxiety. Yeah. And then I had therapy and started like, yeah. I do have anxiety, you're right. Yeah. And then the pain went away in my stomach. Wow. And even now, if I have really, really stressful days or really quite bad anxiety, yeah. I get the exact same you pain. Can feel it coming. I can feel it in my body. And I find it so interesting how anxiety and stress can sit yeah. within the human body. 
Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? And and that connection between the brain and the gut is insane. It's like so much nervous tissue mm. all throughout the gut, talking to your brain all the time. And there's, you know, IBS, I think, is a really common problem that people experience. And there's uh, issues going on in some cases where we know that the, the gut microbes have sort of shifted. They're producing things that are affecting the nerves, the sensitivity of the nerves. You can get that kind of pain feeling in, mm -hmm. in your um, gut that's communicating to your brain. You start feeling all kind of anxious. Equally, though, your brain can send messages back down because you're worried about something. You know how you have a big event. Sometimes people will feel like they suddenly have to go to the toilet if mm. they're, you know, about to give a talk or something, um, and uh, that's then affecting the, the digestion. And it, it kind of makes sense because I guess, you know, throughout evolution, if you had something really stressful then you, your body's going to be like, well, I'm not going to prioritize digestion right now because mm -hmm. that's costing a lot of energy and time. So I'm going to put my energy into other areas. And so you need to have that connection between you know, what, what you're thinking, what's the immediate threat and other physiological processes. Mm -hmm. So is that in favor of like the fight or flight situation rather than the gut? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Is that why people sometimes quite often get ill and around exams or interviews and stuff like that because they're hyper stressed about things and then it's affecting the immune system yeah definitely so again the immune cells have receptors on the surface for um things like adrenaline noradrenaline and um cortisol so all the stress chemistry and there's really interesting studies usually they do them in students because they're you know, easy, willing yeah. uh, participants mm -hmm. and they're studying for their exams and they can show that the cortisol levels, you know, in the first year of uni at exam time are, are going up and then the second year they go up even more and then the third year they go up even more and they um, look for different parameters of how the immune system's functioning and they can see that goes down. Uh, and every year that they progress through their degree, the higher cortisol is, is correlating with the lower immune function. And then, you know, students are living, you know, normally in student digs, surrounded yeah. by loads of people, lots of germs can be shared and then you get sick just before your exams. So, so interesting that as well. That, I mean, that was me. I used to get, honestly, the stress that I had for exams, oh. like I absolutely... <laughs> hated them and then you'd forget everything and you'd you'd worry mm -hmm. and it was such a shame because like coursework I was fan like loved coursework fantastic I'm calm <laughs> I'm relaxed and then yeah when exam period would hit I was always really poorly just didn't feel myself and but that was just couldn't do anything about it because it was just the system that's yeah. the way it's really tricky it works. I mean I teach now I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Sussex so I have contact with students all the time and there's a real there's the two pots of students the ones that hate exams, love mm. coursework, and then there's yeah. the ones that actually hate coursework, love exams. But it's really hard to think of different ways that we can get yeah. you to test your knowledge without putting you through that. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just, uh, we need to come up with a better system. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be asking to be quite like temporary, can't you, or temperamental in terms of where certain people get it, because I had a bout of it, was it last year? It was before ba basically I was, Florida. I proposed to Lucy last year. And in the run up to that, I was like the most stressed internally I've probably ever been in my life. Oh, wow. And I got like the worst stomach issues so for, for 12 weeks. I, I had to switch over to FODMAP and everything that I was eating was just triggering my stomach. Oh, I was going to the doctors, they didn't know what it was. Um, I had a load of blood tests wow. done, different stool tests done. And then after I popped the question after that, no, it. <laughs> No issues with food. Yeah, like, we, were, we were in America. Yeah, so yeah, literally. we were in America. I was having five guys, steak, yeah, chip, yeah. All, the, all the food I couldn't have for like 12 weeks. Yeah. Fine after that. that so is, it was so interesting. That's so interesting. And I think, mm. sadly, we do always focus on the physical, don't we? When mm -hmm. people are struggling with digestive issues and they might go to the GP and there's various kind of you know, anti-spasmodic medications and things they might be given or they might be told to try probiotics or they might be tr told to try a different diet for a period of time. But there's a lot less emphasis on like the mindfulness component, mm -hmm. the sort of gut brain connection. Could you do some sort of yoga or meditation in the evenings? And I think we do need to really elevate that side of things because as we were saying in the beginning, you can't have physical health without the mental health component. Um, but somehow the mental health things always seem much more tricky. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I just can't find the time to meditate and do all those things yeah. that I know are gonna work for me to, to help really my anxiety and so we need to somehow 
you know, remove the friction for those and, and get that conversation going so that, you know, GPs and other healthcare professionals will have that conversation, you know, and doing things within the NHS that involve, you know, mindful practices mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. supporting people with these kind of issues. I think some, sometimes, sorry, they're, they're, they're like tangibly hard to measure as well, aren't they? So yes, it's difficult yeah. then to, to prove or disprove that something's working or yeah, not working. Yeah, they often take time, I think, as well, which is... I was just going to say, with. so with GPs... Is it just the fact they're not taught about mental health at medicine school, really, to be able to talk about like gut health and different things like that? Because it wasn't even suggested to me at all. It wasn't even last year suggested to you that, oh, like, are you stressed or are you feeling some sort of way? Do you think GPs just aren't as clued up on that particular area in terms of how it can affect your like gut health and how you are? Yeah, I think there's definitely like, sort of lag time from when the science comes out to when that filters down to things like the training Mm. that people receive. Um, And then there will be some people who are really savvy and and, and on it and maybe doing um, research and doing some CPD. But I think on the whole, because it's not sort of interwoven solidly into the curriculum, although that's starting to change now, then it, you know, you'll have a workflow of the mm. questions to ask, the treatment options, and these things just won't be on, you know, on that um, piece of paper, so mm. they don't come up. But then I know some amazing um, gastroenterologists who, you know, are also qualified in hypnotherapy and yoga, and they will talk to their patients about that, and they also, you know, do work with clients um, outside of the NHS. So there are pockets of people where this is happening, and I think the more that things like gut health get talked about the more that we can no longer ignore it it has to sort of be woven into the the healthcare system Mm -hmm. i think the more these conversations are had the better that is because i think some people feel like they've been fobbed off if you just tell them it's like it could be a bit of anxiety it could be a bit of stress and again like we said it's hard to measure i know a lot of people they were told that maybe by the doctor just think well what am i supposed to do with that and i think it's then difficult for for people to then take that and do anything with it yeah and even things like you know you guys have both mentioned the FODMAP diet like that's something you really need to work with a nutrition professional because it's a minefield and it shouldn't be something that you do for prolonged periods like there's all these kind of guidelines and I know so many people who've just been told oh try this and they you know they get a leaflet with what foods to avoid and they're left to their own devices and that's really quite yeah uh, it could be really quite dangerous, dangerous. I, I was i was sick of white rice and tuna by then that'll tell you that it was just it was very very strange food though so they said to me like download this app mm. and it had like red foods and green foods and it was things like i just kept having like aubergine like fried aubergine with like plain chicken i could i couldn't have carrots and broccoli or ginger and onion they were like an absolute no and it was just it was it was really complicated but I did it because I thought that well that's the only solution they have personally given me yeah so that must work after yeah. like three years and then you've had this little surgery and it was almost there was no other information out there for it so even though in my head I thought this is stupid yeah I'm gonna do it anyway yeah. <laughs> because I don't well, I don't know what to, else yeah and I think it sometimes with these chronic um symptoms or conditions you you have to go through a path of exploration Mm. hopefully hand in hand with your doctor and because sometimes there isn't a clear like this is what we should do sometimes Mm -hmm. it's like we will try this but for a really defined period of time with you know input and advice from relevant healthcare professionals and then we will reflect and see if it's worked and then we'll try something else and if people are you know listening at home and they worry that they're having these kind of digestive symptoms and they haven't got anywhere with their doctor then taking a really you know um, detailed food and symptom diary I know it's really tedious Mm. to do can be really useful as a starting point because we often don't really reflect exactly what we eat how we are we chewing our food you know Mm. are we sitting in a relaxed place are we dealing with the stress at work while we're trying to um, stuff down our lunch and then maybe you want to think about removing something from your diet to see because you think oh I suspect it's when I have this but only remove that don't change anything else you know do it like you're doing an end of one experiment and you make your own little little plan and Mm. record everything and that is probably the only way that you can get to the other side and without just eliminating 12 Mm. things at once (laughs) taking 15 (laughs) supplements you know changing everything at home Mm. and and then you don't know what was the lever that I needed to pull and now I'm on this really restricted diet and I don't know which food 
foods to reintroduce because I don't want to go back to yeah. triggering all the that's symptoms. Ho- that's definitely hard to do. I think even when I was doing it, it was, it was yeah. difficult to, to navigate through and know what to do next. And yeah. There's, there's so many, di- especially if you Google something as well, there's so many different things that yes. will populate and you try different <laughs> things. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask was that, um, this is kind of personally related to me, is how much does like having an illness or virus and something then permanently affect the immune system moving forward. The reason I asked that is because I had meningitis when I was 18. Mm-hmm. Um, was it meningococcus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had that. Um, I remember being told at the hospital, like your immune system will be altered or it'll be, it could even be permanently affected moving forward. I didn't really understand what that, what that could mean, but even sort of in that year to two years following having meningitis, I just, was picking up colds yeah. all of the time. It can be, it can take quite a hit on your um, on your immune system, and there will be like often a period of recovery. But it, I think the one way to think about it is what what's your current health now? Do you feel like you're pretty in good health, and you don't pick up more than sort of average? Yeah, you know, four it, or five, it's six. F- fine now. But like at that time, that period for like a year or two, I would just be ill. Yeah. All, all of the time. Yeah. Um, but but even in terms of adaptation to viruses and sickness and bugs and colds or whatever, what is the permanent impact on the immune system once you've had that illness and then it, you've recovered from it? I think n- it, not everyone will have a permanent it's sort of impairment. It's it, obviously it's a consideration, but I think for most people, especially now, if you feel like you don't have any kind of unusual patterns of infection, then probably you're not affected. I think. Um, uh, having a blood panel done to have a look at the different immune cell populations would be quite revealing. I don't know if you've done that with any of the blood work have, you've uh, done. But could, yeah. but could you be beneficiaries as well from having an illness and then overcoming it in terms of being uh, immune to that type? Yeah, so when you get exposed to something like a virus or a bacteria, you will develop an immune response. So you start making armies of you know your immune cells and, and producing antibodies. And then after you've cleared the infection, this kind of shrinks back, but you keep little pockets of these cells that are specific for that germ. And this is our sort of memory bank. So that means if you're exposed again, you've already got that immunity in place. Um, but just some infections are a bit more intense for your immune system to handle than others. Um, and so there can be this kind of long, prolonged battle that goes on once this sort of acute illness is cleared. Suppose that ties in heavily to what we were speaking about before with COVID and during yeah. that during that period, because there's, there's then started being different strands of things. That's where the big worry was, wasn't it? In terms yeah. of never really mm-hmm. having a immunity to it. Exactly. I mean, if you think about, you know, in evolution, we evolved on this planet with germs always being present. So they are trying to infect us because that we provide this nice warm habitat where they can multiply and then we can cough on our neighbor and spread, (laughs) you know, spread it around. Um, And so then we evolved to have an immune system that could be like, right, we don't want these things making us sick. We're going to try and find multiple ways to get rid of them. And so then the viruses then have that selective pressure to evolve to try and avoid the Mm -hmm. immune defenses. So you have this constant back and forth, which has, you know, gone on for millennia. So yeah, the, the minute we get on top of a virus, viruses in particular are really good at sort of mutating and then they will sort of shift their genes a little bit so that they look a bit different and it's like we've been exposed to a whole new virus for the first time and you have to go through that whole process of making the antibodies from scratch Mm -hmm. rather than using the bank that you've already made from the last time you saw it. We were really surprised how we felt the first time we had Mm -hmm. COVID because we're very healthy Mm. people I could not, the first time I had COVID, I think it was at Christmas or it was the first lockdown or something, I couldn't go up the stairs without being so out of breath. And it was really obviously worrying at the time, but then we've had it like twice again since and it's kind of just been like, oh, a cold. Yeah. That's just kind of passed through. Yeah. And then you've obviously, because you've, I mean, we're both obviously vaccinated as well, but at the time I remember thinking, no like this because <laughs> before you had it you kind of thought no it's not as bad as people yeah, are saying yeah and then it hit us and we were like oh my god i feel like i'm actually really really poorly well, if there's any consolation we were all really sick too. <laughs> yeah really, the first really poorly. time and um, i think we've yeah. had it since i think having kids in school you bring it back it but, up. <laughs> yeah exactly but it's never been more than like a mild yeah. cold since but yeah it's you know nobody had seen the virus before mm. so we don't have any prior immunity even when there's a new strain of influenza you might have some prior immunity to some of the 
bits on on the virus that the immune system recognized but that was the kind of initial scare with covid was mm-hmm. just, it's brand new nobody has that prior bank mm-hmm. of immunity and if people are getting really sick and ending up in hospital it's not until the infections out there in the world that you get a grasp of just how many people are going to be in hospital because obviously mm-hmm. That number is not clear in the beginning because you've just got pockets being infected as the infection spreads. Yeah, you're speaking about before like temperatures and viruses, like in the the human body because it's a warm warm space. Yeah, is it usually that heat kills viruses and bugs and colds make it spread? And that's why during the winter time, that's why we seem to pick up more illnesses. Is that true? So when you, you mean when you get a fever or when the air temperature is warm? So like there's a lot of stuff about like with foods and this. That's why we heat foods or microwave uh, yes, foods or toast yeah. foods. It kills a lot of the yeah. bacteria. Yeah. So b- bacteria will have their kind of niche where they want the just the right temperature, humidity, everything um, and supply of nutrients so that they can multiply. So that might be like... You know, if they get in your body, it's nice and warm. You've got lots of nutrients mm. around. Um, and so, yeah, you want to heat food to a certain temperature to make sure you get rid yeah. of any potential food poisoning. You've all, you know, we all know that that one meal you didn't reheat yeah. properly from from last night's dinner, you got really, really mm. sick because you heated it enough to allow the bacteria to flourish, uh, but not enough to kill them all. Mm. <laughs> so, but then when it's winter and it's cooler, viruses prefer that cool, dry air in winter. So we tend to get more winter colds yeah, and colds. summer colds yeah the the kind of avenue that i'm going down with this and i don't know if you've seen like any research or data on it is at the moment what seems to be ever more sexy on social media is hot and cold therapy i wonder oh, if you've yes. seen anything to do with, like the immune responses to yeah. ice baths and saunas. there is there's um some really really lovely studies and it's getting really popular i, mean, I live down in brighton so there's like huge a lot of cold water huge yeah. people <laughs> that are into the cold water honestly every time you're down the seafront at dawn it's just like you know yeah. the, the communities of people getting in the sea all year round um and hot i am a big fan of hot i have a sauna in my garden so i'm like we're just waiting on ours to arrive amazing can't wait yeah i need to i need to get rid of the trampoline for the kids so i can fit a nice tub in there but um yeah it's so there's the hot and cold are doing similar but different things so heat is is um emulating a bit of cardiovascular uh, activity so you know we've mentioned about exercise being really important for the immune system so when you get hot similar things are happening your heart rate goes up you know if you wear a, a watch that can you know or something that mm-hmm. measures your heart rate you'll notice that you go from resting to maybe mm-hmm. over 100 beats per minute um uh, you're sweating changes to the blood vessels changes to the metabolic rate so it's you know like you're going for a run but you're just sitting there which can be a really useful thing if people have injuries or um can't do um cardio to use the sauna um the other thing it does is it raises what we call heat shock proteins so these are little proteins that are induced as the name suggests when it gets hot and they kind of protect all the different structures in our cells. Um, so they're particularly important for our immune cells. So they're going to sort of just make them a bit more robust. So it's kind of like um, increasing the cellular defenses and making them a bit more kind of um, able to deal with, you know, the daily wear and tear. Um, and then when we get in cold, we get cold shock proteins. So they're kind of the opposite. They, they get induced when we're cold. And again, they have that kind of protective effect on the cellular level. So there's definitely immune benefits from hot and cold. The cold as well, we get the, the shivering. It's changing, um, it's altering the, the fat. So you get in cold a lot, you have more brown fat. So that has a higher metabolic need. So um, it tend to be the sort of healthier fat as well. So there could be benefits there. Um, it's also uh, a stress on the body. So you're deliberately putting yourself into a stressful environment. You know, you go into the ice bath, you can get out at any point. So it's um, you're in control. Yeah. It's not like going to work and dealing with a boss yeah, all absolutely. day, every day. And that, I think, is um, releasing the stress chemistry, but in a very controlled way that almost makes you feel more resilient to walking mm-hmm. into that stressful situation at work. So, um, And we know that stress is really important for um, it can be damaging for the immune system when it's too much, but those short-term bursts of stress chemistry can be really good for immune function. So there's sort of multiple levels that the heat and cold are, are working on, and um, I think it just makes people feel good. You know, you yeah. get that yeah. little adrenaline We've been bus. doing ice baths since Quite January, long, yeah. and like like you said, then in terms of 
building resilience mm-hmm. in terms of putting yourself into that environment. Every time we get out, you can't help but smile because you just feel yeah. feel good and energized in yourself yeah, and you've, you've done, done something, something hard. hard at the start yes. of the day. So even if there's yeah. not tons and tons of physiological data yeah. to back up the, the psychological, oh, the psychological is huge. Are great as well. And like we're looking forward to doing some of the the sauna and doing the hot and cold oh, experiment yeah. and some of that which would be it's so good <laughs> be, so what, what sort of temperatures do you have the sauna at them to be uh i think when we got it it probably was between 70 75 but now i'm more like 80 85 so it's just sort of eking it up and mm. try and do half an hour oh, at a time i struggle in saunas yeah. i get really yeah i get really hot and i almost like start to panic a bit oh, when it gets like have to too hot build it up yeah, yeah. gradually yeah. you're you're, you're fantastic myself, yeah. yeah you can just sit in it <laughs> Whereas like, but it's the same with the ice bath when we first started, you're in for like 30 seconds, yes, your yeah. shoulders are in, and now I sit like with my neck yeah. in. And you, you slowly can, build it up. You slowly yeah. build it up. So I think that's really important as well. People don't need to dive in and be yeah. an ice bath and sauna expert. It's just exactly. build yourself up slowly because I've seen the best benefits, like more so for anxiety and psychologically yes. yeah. for the ice bath, like being here, like your vagus yeah. nerve, I think you've got. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, I feel calm. And, I and think, it's fantastic. You know, some of the studies um, have looked at like uh, sea swimmers, cold water swimmers, mm. and they also have this kind of healthy user bias because mm. you know these groups of people they do it as a group, so it's like your social well-being, it's mm-hmm. physical activity because you're swimming in the sea and, and you're getting your vitamin D, your sunlight, you know, you're outside. All of those other things are really good for us. If you're sea swimming in the middle of winter, you're probably also checked in with your you know your sleep your health yeah. your stress so it's not i don't think these things should be seen as a panacea and i see a lot of pushback sometimes on social media going oh everyone's you know ice bathing mm. and stuff and i'm like it, it, do it do it what makes you feel good mm-hmm. you know you don't have to ice bath to have amazing health but try it and yeah. maybe you will <laughs> yeah and yeah. Makes, and that's yeah. the thing if it makes you feel good yeah. whatever makes you feel good exactly movement, yeah just yeah. carry on doing it i yeah. don't think it's because people are doing ice baths that they're healthy i think generally healthy people are the ones who are probably doing the ice baths and exactly it's, yeah you know, that causation correlation haven't you but i think Huber was speaking about some of the stuff in terms of metabolic changes in the brown fat and yeah i think i heard them also speaking about something about how people who are ice bathing regularly and getting that cold exposure then when they were in other cold adv- environments where they had that adaptation so they yeah. dealt better with the cold as well because yeah. of the responses that they had from it. Exactly. I think it's one of those key things that can just show how adaptable mm. we are as humans. Like, you know, we've lived on the planet for millennia. We can live in all different terrains all over the globe. We're so adaptable. And just by doing your first ice bath and like being in for like 20 seconds and then doing that regularly and then, you know, in a few months you're suddenly doing three minutes just shows that mm. the capacity for resilience can really build up over quite short periods of time which i just find fascinating yeah it fascinates me quite a lot the, the hot and cold i mean i've we've only done the cold stuff at the moment but yeah i I'm, i've not looked into the science enough in terms of what the hot to cold does and what the benefits of that are i don't know if you've looked into yeah that. i mean i think there's got to be something with again the adaptation one minute your body's trying to cool the, the the body down because you're in this hot environment and that's having different effects on your cardiovascular system then suddenly you're going into the cold <laughs> and you're getting the reverse and your body's right okay we're getting cold are we getting too cold do we need to sort of reverse some of this so again it's just the, the, the body's capacity to deal with these yeah. different physiological states and um, there might be more you you know different things that we can find out as the science develops mm. but i think when you look in cultures that this is done regularly like in finland there is normally a ritual where you will go from the sauna and jump into yeah. the cold so um there's just something quite intuitive about it i think when do, when do you usually do your sauna do you do it early on the day or late at night uh, late at night when the kids go to bed so i turn it on nice. go upstairs oh, nice. do all the bedtime and everything so it's nice and warm yeah. I, it was a bit of a random thing to, to put in our garden but to be honest the best decision i've yeah. ever made yeah. <laughs> i can't wait now the cost yeah, per use excited. is coming yeah. down so yeah i think a few people spoke about how it's better to like finish the day with heat because then you'll be like going to sleep yeah. winding down and then in the morning better to start with the the cold if yes. it wakes you up and yeah. then if you are doing the hot and cold try to finish on cold especially yes. if it's in the morning because you yeah. want to be alive wake for yeah. the day rather than feeling like too yeah. relaxed and sloping into your day exactly it's a good way to sort of round off your day and mm. and if you not everyone has a sauna in their back garden but if you can find a gym or a space there's a, down where i live in brighton there's loads of community saunas mm. and so you, you know regularly we just go with friends and 
you've got a bunch of your you and your mates you know in a sauna and that's all the feel-good chemistry as well mm. like that social Absolutely. bonding and everything that's you also leave feeling like that lovely buzz because of the fact you've just been out with your friends and and chatting mm. and I think yeah it's nice one of the things you'd mentioned I think it was either on your TED talk or another podcast but you said something and I thought it was wonderful you said sleep is the foundation of your immune system and yes. even when we're even now we do it as adults when we're tired yeah we're still in bed on our phones and yeah. then you're falling asleep and we still fight sleep kids fight sleep and, yes yeah but I know when you said that I thought it was really important just to even like touch on saying how yeah. important sleep as humans oh is. yeah I'm glad you mentioned this it's a topic that's quite close to my heart so I've got twins who are eight and um they're premature they're we're living in Switzerland, so we're in a foreign country, having babies prematurely. They went straight to the neonatal unit mm. for five weeks. And um, then they come home and you've gone from being in the neonatal unit with all these things attached to them and things beeping every time they stop breathing to suddenly it's just you and the babies mm. and you're like, oh my God, I have to keep them alive. Like, mm. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> it was all a very strange experience. And now when I look back, I realize I just didn't process it at all. And I developed a really weird insomnia. So like a, I would wake in the night thinking the kids were crying, but they weren't, you know, and this went on long after they slept through the night, wake in the night and I could not go back to sleep and I would just hear them crying. Um, wow. So I suffered terribly with insomnia for years. So it's been quite a journey around the whole sleep thing. So I'm always really empathetic to people who have sleep issues because it's like the weirdest mm. form of torture. And there's so, again, it comes down to the psychological component. Like I think about 80% of sleep problems are due, due to what you're thinking so it's not for other reasons it's not because you haven't taken your ashwagandha before yeah. bed it's really because you know you the, the mind is just going crazy and mm. so we need to approach it from the psychological perspective as well but in terms of the immune system it is really the foundation of um your immune health you know you have these two states in your immune system so now we're during the day you know i'm gonna head out on the street soon i'll be on the tube i'll be on the train i'm meeting loads of people breathing in potential germs my immune system's like on alert it's looking out for things it knows that it's daytime and when I go to bed I'm not around people I'm not likely to be infected by people breathing on me mm -hmm. um so it switches into a kind of housekeeping state so it's like taking care to clean up the you know the running of your body making sure um healing and repair can happen dealing with you know all of those other jobs so there's two different kind of states that our immune system's in and it's guided by our circadian rhythm so most of the uh, immune cells are under circadian control so when we wake up in the morning we see sunlight it's telling our brain it's daytime and all these little genetic switches are happening going okay now we have to do this and then the same in the evening we get the, the melatonin, we feel sleepy, and it changes state again. So when we don't have this balance, of course, everything starts to unravel and your immune system's not gonna do its job mm. as well. And it is a strange time that we live in because we do deliberately keep ourselves up at night um, and we will sit there. And I think, you know, the blue light from our devices is one thing, but also the type of content we're consuming. Yeah. You know, if you're scrolling in the Twitter hole, I'm yeah. sorry, but it's not the blue light that's the problem yeah, keeping yeah, you awake. Absolutely, absolutely. It's probably that, like, you know, um, uh, rabbit hole you went down reading about someone shouting at someone else or yeah, whatever. And, yeah, you do yeah. get into a spiral and then you know the whole life and then, yeah. yeah well, so exactly. that's such a social and cultural thing of like sh shark Mondays <laughs> and hard work in the room and the only the the lazy sleep which causes that yeah. kind of those bad habits as well to try and stay up and we work and for as long as possible and mm. feel that social pressure that you've always got to be yes, on the go and yeah. doing something and never relaxing and chilling out and it's hard now that we've gone to this kind of weird um hybrid working where a lot of people now work from home more yeah. mm -hmm. which in some ways is great but i think it stops the buffers being on at, when you leave the office yeah. i noticed this mm -hmm. with my husband like he isn't very good at saying okay it's it's the end of the day I'm going to shut the laptop and leave the mm -hmm. office and it's kind of eeks oh I can just go and do that one more thing and then suddenly two hours later you're still yeah. on your work computer and it's nine o'clock in the evening and like a plane going into land you can't, you don't just fall out of the sky you need to kind of have that time to prepare yourself for sleep and you know I think if somebody's never had sleep problems guarantee they will have had insomnia but they won't it's not in the forefront of their mind because that doesn't happen very frequently but if someone has insomnia they, they might start to obsess about 
how to sleep yeah. and the protocol and and we see it a lot on the internet this is what you need to sleep you take these supplements yeah. you do this three hours before bed you make your bedroom in this state and i think there's a danger of maybe going too far the other way in sleep trackers as well people can be like oh I've, I've woken up and it tells me i've had a terrible night's sleep but i feel okay and so we kind of just also need a bit of intuition mm -hmm. and think about what what makes a human being sleep you know as a mum, i make my kids bedroom all nice and we do a wind down and bedtime stories and all this kind of stuff am i doing something similar and equivalent for me you know or am i sitting there on my laptop you know and then yeah. suddenly going right it's late i need to get up at a certain time and and trying to just drop off to sleep so for me it's been a big journey and i think mm. that it's something that we need to be aware of if you are picking up colds all the time definitely check in with your mm. sleep so you're one night of bad sleep your natural killer cells which are really important for fighting viruses they can take a huge dive and then you know you go out to work you're commuting much more vulnerable to picking up things mm -hmm. i think one thing that came to mind there is like pe i think people sometimes go the other way and they get so obsessed with like the most optimal environment to be able to yeah. sleep and then when they can't do it they're like oh i'm not going to be able to get to sleep properly in my, my yes, bedroom tonight yeah. and like how me 20 30 years ago there wasn't an hour morning routines where people were taking yeah. greens, doing ice baths, <laughs> doing sleeps and doing blue light. People yeah. were going to work on black coffee or bacon butty and a bit of hope. So yeah. I think you'll be okay if you miss out <laughs> on your ice bath and your greens this morning. But exactly. The, the other thing is about this two things from the sleep thing is I only just thought about when you were speaking about it was I probably picked up the most colds when I've been like run down from yeah. lack of sleep for like yeah. a week. And then secondly, I usually get a cold as soon as we get on hold. I mean, I'd imagine that's probably a change of environment, but also yeah. because of the circadian rhythms being completely yeah. off and traveling as well. Yeah, so the sleep thing is, is, is huge. So I think anyone who's getting colds or any infection more frequently, or they can't shake them off, or they're getting unusual symptoms of a, you know, routine infection, definitely check in with your sleep and thinking about the quality, not just the amount you know, work back from when you need to wake up in the morning, have a consistent wake in bedtime seven days a week, not just, you know, Monday to Friday. And then the other thing you mentioned, there's an actual phenomenon, it's called leisure sickness. So that thing where we get to our holiday and then we're really excited, but the buildup can sometimes be quite stressful. I've got things to get done. I've got to pack. I've got to find time to pick up some bits for the country I'm traveling to. And you're really stressed and you don't quite realize how stressed you are, but you've got all that stress chemistry. So you're sort of suppressing your immune system, making yourself more vulnerable. Then you hop on a plane surrounded by, you know, hundreds mm -hmm. of people in a small uh, area. Yeah. Um, you're very run down. You arrive to paradise, you know, finally you can relax, feel good, and then you get sick. So yeah. it is a, a known thing. And there's quite a lot of studies that have looked at and this. And along that way, you've changed your diet as well from what it used to be to airplane exactly. food and whatever. Yeah, crap. there's the circadian rhythm, there's the diet aspect. Yeah, there's a lot of things. Um, so it's good to think about that ahead of traveling. If you mm -hmm. can be more organized, make that week lead up a little bit less stressful, do things to try and get yourself on the right time zone, you know, pack your own food or, or be a bit careful about what you're eating and where just as you transition on holiday I think that can be quite helpful mm -hmm. yeah I'm the type of person who packs like the week before I don't, and I I don't, don't need to worry Love about it. it I've printed everything off it's all in binders and I don't take on Ben's stress because he's packing the night before and I'm just like yeah you do <laughs> you you do you <laughs> you do you I'm not stressed I'm absolutely fine but yeah we love it different aren't we not? I think are you a whoop user or sorry do you use whoop uh, no, I have never tried a whoop actually. I had an it's Apple Watch like and then me, it um, it randomly just broke after about two years. Oh. So I was, and they said they couldn't fix it. It's nothing they can do. These have been, these, we've used them for like uh, maybe a year or so. They've been good, especially yeah, because you were talking about sleep quality. Some, yeah. some nights they'd be like, well, I've had eight or nine hours of sleep and I still feel like shit. But then I'd look at some of the stats on this when I started wearing it. It was, yeah. it was like my REM sleep was terrible and ah, HRV wasn't great. Yeah. So it was interesting seeing some of those stats yeah. that I, were kind of underlying and even though i'd had a, a good length of sleep yeah the, the quality wasn't wasn't great i think that it would be really interesting i think there's a lot of utility in them if the mm. person has a good relationship with the technology yeah. and whoop seems to be one of the sort of leaders in terms of the quality of mm. the data and the mm. measurements that they do um and i think it's yeah it's quite a, i'd love to do studies with uh, i think something like a whoop where 
um, people are taking their metrics and just before they get a cold, you can look back at the data and be like, oh, those three or four days before you woke up with a cold, what was going on? Did you see a change in your HRV? Because we know that that can mm -hmm. track quite closely to when people are getting unwell, sleep changes, stuff like that. Yeah, well, I've had my stag do, so I tracked it after having a hangover, and that's a whole yeah, another realm red. of yeah. recovery and HRV and sleep, which is took a, took a dive. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think alcohol in particular, you, you know, people might think that that helps you sleep because you go home and pass out, but I think you're the quality of sleep is Terrible. always going to be affected. And I, that's where these trackers can be most revealing, can't they? Mm -hmm. Because you don't want to yeah, maybe absolutely. admit that your evening glass of wine is affecting your sleep, but it's only when yeah. you stop. Mm -hmm. I had a worse recovery, because I don't drink that often, but we went yeah. to the Chester races. We drank quite a lot because you are day drinking. Yeah. I had a worse recovery that night well, the next morning than I did after running 100k. So I was worse <laughs> off than the amount of alcohol that I had consumed wow. and the 100k. And that, well, that is uh, from what the whoop told me. That's really so interesting. So yeah. running 100k takes yeah, less I was, out yeah. of you. <laughs> I was better. I was better than the alcohol. I think yeah. sometimes uh, like at first can be yeah, a bit it's placebo strange. because it's like, it just helps with habit change I think a bit yeah. it makes you yeah. conscious of oh I'm going to bed at this time and I'm actually waking up at this time which is yeah. which is good but I think for some people who don't need to know all the metrics and maybe get yeah. too anal and consumed about all the data yeah, rather than just exactly. they need to know the basics it's it's not great but I think it's definitely been helpful in tracking stuff. Yeah. with alcohol then does that have a, an impact on the immune system we obviously spoke about how it it's going to impact sleep, which is going to have a knock-on effect yeah I think most of the effects are indirect so it's going okay. to be because yeah. of the sleep um, because, you know, you might then pick up other unhealthy habits. So you might eat really, really late when you're not used to eating late. You might eat something you're not used to eating. Sleep quality. The next day when you're hungover, you might consume things. And also it's not very helpful for our gut lining. So it's kind of quite a, I guess you could call it toxic for the, the gut barrier, which is quite delicate. So that inflammatory component, I don't think it's very helpful for the gut microbes, even though there's several kind of good ones. Mm. you know polyphenols are good for you but i think overall you know it's it's a negative mm -hmm. and just because i know this might be me just having the dark i know we've got a lot of female listeners does the menstrual cycle have any impact on the immunity or immune system yes yeah i covered a bit of this in my first book i think it's something i'd like to expand out because there's so much interesting stuff to discuss around this but again you know going back to this idea of your immune system being the sensing system the immune cells have on the surface receptors for the key sex hormones. So um, estrogen and progesterone, if we think about those two, which are the key ones that are fluctuating across the menstrual cycle, we know that their behavior is changing. Um, so generally in the first half of um, the menstrual cycle, you have pretty, your immune system is working really good, it's very happy. And then in the second two weeks, when you have that sort of high hormone phase just before you get your period, that's when the immune system tends to be working a little bit less effectively. You might be more susceptible to picking things up in that period. So it's quite subtle. Um, the one thing it can affect is getting urinary tract infections or infections in um, the vagina, things like that, because um, it's changing the whole environment of those mucosal surfaces. So yeah, but, and even the, the period itself, the shedding of the lining of the womb, that's inflammatory. So we've got uh, raised inflammatory levels, so you might not feel as good um, during that time. Yeah, we always say to people, it's like really important just to understand your cycle as a woman. Yeah. Does it affect your training, your yeah. nutrition? Yeah. Like, why exactly. am I craving something? Why do I feel weaker in the gym? And yeah. it all kind of makes sense when you you start tracking it. Because I don't yeah. think it's as much as, it used to be a very taboo topic and then we yeah. spoke about yeah. it. And, people are a lot more open about it now, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I think it is really important. It's a vital sign though. So it's, you know, we have all the different vital signs to, to make sure that we're healthy. And for our women, that is maybe an additional way of making sure that your body's functioning optimally. And if you do have that tracking information, it can be good to then go to your doctor if something is changing. Yeah. And then, you know, if you're also having symptoms, they've got then data, particularly around the perimenopause, there's lots of great apps where you can log um, all the different information about your cycles. Mm -hmm. And if you're like, I'm not sure if this is perimenopause and your doctor then has some data to, to look yeah. at and say, okay, things are changing and maybe then that will help with interventions. But mm -hmm. I think everyone's quite unique, aren't they? And, yeah. and some people yeah. they'll say, oh, it doesn't affect me at all. I feel the same every day of the month. But I think for most women, 
you know certain weeks that you're just not mm-hmm. optimal. And I think in the gym, there's a lot of people trying to get data on how performance is affected or if it's affected during different phases of the cycle. And again, it's quite hard to tease out because, you know, if you're a trained athlete, you might be used to performing yeah. even mm-hmm. when you don't feel great. Um, but I think that it's a really useful thing. And then if you're in that period where you're not feeling great just before your period, you can focus on other things like technique, yeah. mm-hmm. maybe not the heavy lifts or yeah. pushing yourself to your max and, and sort of mm-hmm. work more intuitively. That's why these conversations I think are important though as well, because especially like as coaches, we've been through the different coaching courses and the personal mm-hmm. training courses, and there's not a lot that covers this kind of thing. So especially right. from a, a guy's perspective who doesn't actually go through that or yeah. have any real mm-hmm. impact of it, then coaching women, it can be hard to empathize because you yeah. don't have any practical experience of dealing with it. And then for a woman going through those stages, the like luteal phase of the the cycle, yeah. having to potentially deal with those other things where they should be working at a lower RP, yeah. there may be higher risk of injury. Yeah. Um, there could be higher energy expenditure through certain phases. Yeah. Then so, some people's training might need to change, but like you said, it can be very dependent on the individual. Yeah. But just, just knowing these things and being conscious of them, yeah. I think, and may help deal with them. your clients be able to feel comfortable to yeah. say, even if you're a male trainer, be like, this is what's happening yeah. right now. So then you can be like, right, we're going to adjust things when we get into the gym mm. because you know, you've given me that feedback, but I don't know if people are comfortable to say that yet. Yeah, I think people are becoming more comfortable, definitely. But then as Ben said, it's not even something, well, we did our personal training courses years ago, so I don't know if maybe now it's in the curriculum where they get taught it because everyone um, speaks about it. But yeah, as Ben said, we've spoke about so many things today that people's eyes are going to be like, oh my God, I didn't know that. (laughs) Like, this is absolutely amazing. And all the information you have given is honestly incredible. Like Aww. half the stuff that I didn't even know. So, just because you said eyes, isn't there something weird with the eyes and the immune system? Yeah, I've read, eyes. Yeah, I've read something that's like off. It's like offset from the immune system was different, or has a different immune response or something. Oh, the eyes are really unique. They're what we call immune privileged. That's so, it. Immune privileged. Yeah, also you, you, privileged. your immune system doesn't really get access to your eyes. So if you injure one eye it kind of releases all the, what we call antigens, or the bits of the eye into the body, and it can lead to your immune system starting to attack the other eye, because it's never seen that before. Yeah, it's kind of an unusual. Oh, protect this, your eyes. Yeah, certain certain Is that because they the don't body. want the eyes to get inflamed as well to like respond yeah, to Yeah, I think maybe because it's quite a vital <coughs> sense yeah. over evolution. That, Just a bit, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the body's kind of made these, um, also the male testes, these are also immune privileged, so. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> there must be very important. Yeah, I, heard, I heard someone saying like, that's why they have from the body in terms of like warmth and some, something else sure that someone was speaking about on rogan the other week yeah. but why they're staying off in the body yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely but where can people find more review your books and everything like oh, that oh yes so yeah i've written two books um immunity the science of staying well was the first one and then your blueprint for strong immunity um i'm most active on instagram so you just find me dr jenna machoki um try to do a bit on twitter but (laughs) one social media is enough (laughs) to to juggle with um yeah so that's uh come and join the conversation it's lovely to hear from people so and books will be on amazon i'm guessing as well yeah yeah Yeah. amazon or all the sort of usual book places yeah yeah so everyone who's watching or listening incredible podcast has been one of my favorites mm-hmm. so insightful thank you and it's been absolutely wonderful so when the podcast goes live guys make sure you ask questions share anything like that as well and it was an absolute pleasure thank you you're Thanks amazing for having me <laughs> awesome thanks that was awesome